you don't know how much that hurts. Ah. Working so hard to get that thing. And then he comes off. Oh, man. Well, I learned a little something there. But that's a clue. They might be deeper in these pads. We'll have to fish a little deeper in there and see what we can do. So far, we're struggling out here. And not sure this is the right thing to do right now. That was crazy. I was reeling it in and he ate it. Felt like a big fish too. Came here because <laughs> in the past, three or four other occasions, I lost big fish in this spot. I can hook them, but I never seem to get them in the boat and it might have just happened again. I will keep trying though. And there's more and that's a pretty good one he wanted it he got him a face full of beaver <laughs> Good pad fish. Let's put him back. He's over three. Not three and a quarter. Maybe three and a half. He had the shoulders. swing on those because if they feel you before you feel them they're gone they're gonna let go of the bait especially at a pressured lake like knock mix he was in there Fast one, then none. <laughs> uh, that felt like a heavy one too. He 
just got off. Oh, man. I cannot win. That was a pig. I gotta do a better job of getting out. That was a big fish. I gotta do a better job at getting them out of the pads. I need maybe heavier equipment. Um, I'm not quite sure, but uh, that was a good one. Uh, I think that was the biggest fish of the day. That was a good fish. There's a couple of them in here and they're eating right now. Uh, they're turned on. They're not always eating like this. But right now, it turned on. That one patted me. I was not in good position when I set the hook. And therefore, I, wasn't, I didn't have the rod close enough here to me. And, and uh, I had him out of most of them. There was just one pad left that I didn't think he'd get in it. Because usually, they only get in the real thick ones. But he found that one pad stem and got on and on. And right, so what they do is they, get the, they go into the stems the hook of the bait the hook of the bait gets wedged into those stems and then they they just wedge off the fish just wedge right off the hook and uh, that's been happening to me, to me way too much today I have no words for that. Okay, right in his nose. <laughs> That's a good one. Three pounder. Three pounder. I'll take that all day. Back. Jeez. Just caught this one outside of the pads. Second fish I caught outside of the pads today. It's these clouds. It's got him roaming around a little bit more. He was on a piece of wood though. Just on a little piece of wood out here. Not a bad fish. are not giants, but boy, every one of them has a really good fat gut on it. They're eating good in the pads. <sighs> Another fun pad fish. Come back.
Well, I guess by now you're realizing that there's quite a bit of bass in the pads down in Lake Nakamixon. You know, it's funny that I started to fish that pattern because uh, I always knew those fish are there. They're not easy to catch. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people doing it. There wasn't a lot of people that seemed to be willing to get in there with hand-to-hand -hand combat with those bass. So I thought I'd give it a shot and uh, see how the fishing was. And that's the basis of this video. I'm going to go over everything I've learned over the years uh, in pad fishing. And it's quite extensive, especially pitching the pads the way we were doing in this video. So uh, if this is something that interests you, if you want to learn to fish the pads, if you've been frustrated by pad fishing before, you're gonna watch. You're gonna want to watch this because we're gonna go into everything in detail and cover all of it. So come along with me. Okay, so let's talk about in priority order. You know, how do you go about catching these fish in the pads? And uh, so the number one priority, or actually, it's not one of the priorities, but it's something that we have to take into account before we talk about actually fishing and, and the methodology of fishing pads and that is the equipment that you're using. This is not a place to throw very light action uh, equipment, right? So spinning rods and that kind of thing, it, this isn't the place for that. You want to have a heavy action rod, a bait caster is the best for this type of technique. If you're not familiar with a bait caster and you just don't want to switch over to that or learn that, then what you're going to need is a heavy spinning rod, a spinning rod with a lot of backbone uh, that you can get a good hook set in to, to get that hook through the plastic into the fish's mouth and get them up and out of the pads. As you saw, it's not always easy. I know I lost some of those battles with the bass because they went down in there and they got into those stems, they got the bait hook into the stem, and then they wedge off. And that is extremely frustrating. But there are ways to deal with it, and the number one way is to have the right equipment going in. So starting with uh, how I go about uh, pad fishing, right? So, uh, you know, it, I'm going to give what I think is the priority order for what to consider when, when you're gonna fish pads. And the first priority is location. You know, you hear it in real estate all the time, location, location, location. And it's no different in pad fishing. You know, not all the pads are created equal. Uh, there are things to look for, there are differences, there are, there are things that you want to observe while you're fishing out there. You want to be completely aware of what's going on in those pads. And in this particular video, if you watch, if you know something about that lake and you watch the kinds of pads I'm catching the fish in, you may notice that these pads that I'm catching them in are very large. The pads are big and they're thick. Now I've fished extensively in pads the last few weeks out there and I've fished all kinds, thin, smaller leaf pads, uh, you know, and, I, and some very thick ones with smaller leaves and, and I didn't do so well there. I caught a fish or two, they weren't the bigger ones. The best fish uh, on these last couple outings were in the larger pads and, uh, and that's what they wanted to be under and that's what they wanted to be relating to. So location is key. And then when you're when you're thinking about pads, you you want to look for the irregularities, right? You want to see the edge of those pads. You, if there's a point of pads that comes out, or a pocket, or a hole, anything that's irregular, that's a little bit different than the surrounding pads. Maybe you got some milfoil or coontail growing in with it. Anything that's a little different than the surrounding pads, you want to focus your attention there because it's more likely that the bass will be using that area. You know, I, I'll give you an example of, of uh, some of the things that I've noticed over the years. These pads, they have flowers on them, some yellow, some white. There's a pond that I like to fish in the Poconos that have yellow pads, yellow flowered pads, white flower pads, and lavender flower pads. And every year when I fish there, almost exclusively the fish are relating to the ones with the lavender flowers. And I'm not quite sure why that is. The only thing I can think of is those pads seem to be growing in deeper water. And those that's where the bass typically wanted to be in the last few summers that I was there. So when you notice those kinds of things, you might notice that some pads are yellow, some pads have the white flowers. You know, pay attention to that. And if you're catching bass in, in one and not the other, then just start eliminating the other and focus on the one where of the flowers that uh, where you're catching the bass. This will help you eliminate water faster and zero in on the fish much quicker because you only have so much time out there. I know myself, I don't get a lot of time to fish. A couple hours here, a couple hours there. 
And so it's important for me to be very observant and to, to, to see and figure out quickly what locations have the fish because you know that's the beginning of it all right if if you if there's no fish living where you're throwing you're never going to catch any so location is critical and you have to figure out where those fish are and when it comes to pads the thing you remember is not all pads are created equal so the next the next priority order and this one might surprise you but this is just what i've learned over the years fishing these things and it's not what bait you're using, it's the rate of fall. It's how fast your bait falls through those pads. And sometimes they want a slow rate, and sometimes they want a fast rate. And that just means using a light uh, bullet head sinker or a heavier bullet head sinker. Uh, you know, I typically fish three eighths, half ounce, three quarter ounce, and sometimes I'll go even heavier than three quarter. Generally speaking, the more pressured the water, my personal experience and others may be different, but the more pressured the water, the heavier the sinker I like to throw. There's something about that faster fall that seems to turn those fish on it. It seems to trigger re a reaction strike. They don't have time to, to look it over and think about it. They either attack it or they don't. And that faster fall seems to make a difference in the pressured waters that I fish. Now, you, you may hear other people saying something different. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos just like you guys, and a lot of people say, oh, the slower the fall, the better. Eight, one eighth ounce, or one quarter ounce. And, I, and I'm sure that, and that is true in certain other circumstances that I fished, absolutely. Uh, if it's a cloudy day, for example, or if the fish are extremely active, that slower fall, I think, becomes a better option. If the fish are not that pressured, that slower fall seems to be a better option. But in heavily pressured waters, Generally, I go with the heavier uh, sinkers and it seems to be better for that reaction strike, regardless of what bait I'm throwing. And the next priority order is the bait type, what you're throwing. You know, in a video that you saw, I only had two baits that I caught fish on that I was throwing. One was this, a sweet beaver, a reaction innovation sweet beaver. And the other was a zoom Z craw. Two uh, baits that are both creature baits, but they're very different in the water. They behave very differently. Uh, when I throw the beaver, I always paint the tips of the tail and these two little fins, the tips of them, I, I paint them in chartreuse or yellow marker. And the reason I do that is because I'm trying to imitate a bluegill with this presentation in the pads. Uh, this is what I'm looking for. I, oftentimes I'm looking for bluegill. Now, it doesn't mean there isn't crawfish or crayfish in those pads and that you can't catch them on a crayfish pattern. I know that you can. But generally, day in and day out, where I'm fishing, it's a bluegill bite. And, and so I want to imitate the bluegill. And by putting those little uh, uh, features on the end of the tail and, and the tips, the, if you look at the bluegill in a lot of our lakes and rivers, you'll find that they have that kind of... Uh, aqua glowing color on the very tips of their tails and on their fins and that's what I'm in, imitating. The other thing is even crayfish have that too on their pincers and on their claws. Oftentimes they have uh, bright colors on the tips so it could be imitating that as well but in my mind the deal is a bluegill. I do not separate the tail. If I'm fishing this and I want it to be a crayfish pattern then I separate this tail but when I'm fishing it this way I never separate it. I don't want the tail separated uh, I want the bait to fall very fast and to do this. I want it to dart in different directions, uh, like a tube would. And this is a very similar bait, the way it falls to a tube. When you don't split the tail and you have that heavy weight on there, it, it enters the water and it just goes down quickly or goes this way. And it goes on kind of goofy angles, like it's an injured sunfish. And I think that's what this thing imitates the best. You know, day in and day out, this is my number one bait for throwing in the pads. The other bait that's quite good is is this Z craw, and this is quite different because it's got these it's got the ribs here that give off a lot of vibration, and then obviously these tails they really uh, make a lot of action. And when the fish are active, they I, I find that this bait seems to be better. It's a little larger profile than the than the standard size sweet beaver, uh, and it gives off a, a different action. Instead of having that uh, that odd fall, it falls straight but those tails are, are quivering and moving and these ribs are, are doing their thing. And so, you know, when it's cloudy or when it's even a little rainy or when those bass seem to be moving around or a little more active, I tend to go to this bait and I tend to get some bigger fish on it as well, probably because it's a bigger profile. There is another bait that I throw in the pads and that's worked for me. It's not on this video, but I've caught many fish on it in the pads and it's a zoom brush hog. It's a large creature bait. I do like to throw that in there. When I throw the Zoom Brush Hog, I usually use a lighter weight. I just want that thing to get in there like it's like a, some kind of sickly 
critter or something. And, uh, and I've caught some nice fish with the Zoom brush hog also in the pad. So that's a third bait that I would recommend uh, in your pad fishing. You know, another priority is the color of the bait. And, and some systems, it's more important than others. I find it knock a mix and it's pretty important because, and I think it's because of the darn pressure. You know, you want to pick a color that uh, imitates the forage. I'm not going to get into what those colors are, or what I like the best. Everybody has their own preferences. My suggestion to you though is to, to observe when you go to the lake, look at the dock, look off the dock before you uh, launch your boat or after you launch your boat. Stand on the dock and just look. Usually you'll find the bluegills and some bait fish swimming around. And if you're trying to imitate the bluegills, you want to pick colors that look like what you're seeing in the water. And so that's what I do. And, and uh, like I said, I already uh, told you that I like to paint the tips of the tails. I do the same with the Z-Craw as well, just the very tips, uh, uh, chartreuse dye. Um, I think it just adds a little bit of extra uh, dimension to the bait that the fish really sometimes uh, key in on. Okay, so we talked about, you know, what we're throwing in the weight and the fall and the location. Uh, what, what are you looking for, you know, when we're, when we're fishing pads? What should you be looking for to, to, uh, to put yourself on fish? And, and so we talked about that a little bit already in that we're looking for irregularities in the pads or a duplicate a different cover along with the pads every now and then in some of the pads that i fish if they're near a creek maybe a, that you know during a flood the creek will blow in some brush you know like a, a tree or, or some brush that ends up being in the pads and if you find that and they're in those thick pads i always fish brush because sometimes that uh, attracts some of the larger fish and sometimes you'll find that you don't see it that but it's under there and you can feel that wood down there I've caught some of my biggest bass on wood that you could not see above the pads, but that was below the pads. So finding those are always interesting and always good to find. Anything that's different, irregularity, other cover along with the pads, that could be in the form of other weeds, it could be in the form of wood, it could be in the form of rock, whatever it is, uh, that's the kind of thing you want to find and fish those things. The other thing you want to start taking notice of is the depth, right? The depth that these fish are eating at. And you have to get a few bites to get to, to know this. Uh, but it's in, it's very important to, to know this because it's not it, it changes uh and it's it's uh but once you do know it you, you know where you can expect to get your bite so what i'm talking about is let's say this is the surface of the water and these are my pads up here and right here is the bottom right so maybe there's uh, four feet three feet maybe even up to eight feet some of these pads grow really really in deep water so where are the fish are they down on the bottom under those pads are they somewhere suspended here or are they right under the pad leaves? And what you'll find is they can be in any of those three spots. They can be on the bottom, they can be here, and they can be under here. So you, you want to know what that is because once you figure that out, you can start presenting your bait in a way that puts it in front of them more often. Uh, generally, you know, more often than not, I get my, bite, my, baits, my bites near the bottom. You know, I get that fast fall. It might hit bottom or right before bottom the fish bites. But in these last couple of outings that I was out there, these fish were mostly up here. They were not on the bottom. They were suspended underneath. And uh, so I would have to, you, if you watch, you'll see me. I'm moving the bait. Sometimes I'm lifting it up, hitting, and then just letting it drop, hitting and letting it drop and catch. And I was getting hook hookups that way because those fish, they weren't on the bottom. They weren't here. They were up higher in the pads. And sometimes you'll notice the bluegills are up in there too. Like if you watch when you're out there fishing, you'll see the you see the pads vibrating because you know there's fish swimming right under them, and the and so when they're doing that, they're moving the water around, and you'll see the pad leaves moving a little bit. That tells you that there's activity right under the pads. It could be bluegills, it could be bass, it could be anything chasing. But that's where the activity is, and sometimes it's good to know. But it doesn't mean if you don't see that activity, it doesn't mean there isn't fish down there. Sometimes they're just on the bottom and you just have to throw there and let it go down the bottom and let it sit there a little bit and maybe hop it once and, and see what happens. But this is the kind of thing that you have to start being, being aware of when, when you're pad fishing. You know, we already talked about the types of pads. The other thing to be aware of is, uh, so you have, uh, you're, you're on the outside of the pads and you're looking in and you have a bunch of pads. So here's the shoreline right here, right? And the pads come all the way out to out to here so how far back in here's the shore here's the pads here's open water how far in are these fish are they near the edge of the pads where open water is are they back in the middle are they closer to the bank so this is another thing to consider because uh they move they don't stay in the same places throughout a, a day and this is my experience anyway uh, oftentimes when the sun is high they're back in the middle or even further back 
uh, even closer to the bank sometimes, which is a very hard place to get to sometimes. But they're protected there, and the food's there, and so they don't get hassled much back there, even though it's only a foot or two deep. You'd be surprised at some of the bigger fish that could be back there. Uh, oftentimes I find they're in the middle, and sometimes when they're really active, they're on the edge when you're open water. One thing I'll tell you that I always found interesting is that early in the morning and late in the evening, I, t I tend to find them closer to the edge of the pads, the outside edge. And I think what happens, and I've seen this happen, uh, you know, <laughs> I've seen this happen in the evening especially where I'd be fishing the pads and I'm catching a few and they're, they're pretty deep in. And I'm just kind of sitting out there watching and I see the pads moving. You know, I see them moving because fish are moving underneath them. And a couple of times, and actually quite a few, I would then pitch to the edge or just maybe one pad in, you know, one, one pad leaf in from the edge uh, when I notice this is going on. And it's usually right before dark. And uh, I've gotten some of the biggest bass I've caught that way in pads doing that. And what I think is happening is as the sunlight goes down and you're getting darker and darker, those fish come to the edge. They're looking for a meal. It's easier for them, I think, to get that meal closer to the edge. Or there's some reason they're going there. I don't know why. It doesn't matter. I just know what happens. And if you know it, you can adjust your fishing accordingly. It also happens first thing in the morning. Uh, usually sometime after daybreak, within the first few hours of daybreak, sometimes they seem to be on the edge. And then as the day wears on, they seem to move back. Something that I've noticed uh, in more than one lake uh, where this seems to happen. And the deeper the pads, the more likely it seems to happen. In other words, the deeper the water under the pads, the more likely that, that seems to be uh, a, a pattern or something that the fish do. So we talked about, you know, looking for activity in the pads. You know, how do you know if there's activity? How do you know if the food's there? Well, one way to know is to go up to the pads and just be quiet and listen. Because if there's a lot of food there, Oftentimes you'll hear the bluegills sucking underneath the pads. It's a sucking noise. And they're, they're actually sucking insects and larvae and different uh, food items off the bottoms of those pads. And they're feeding. And so if those bluegills are there, oftentimes the bass are there with them. They might not be right where the bluegills are, but they won't be far away. They won't be far away from that bait. So that's always a clue. If you're seeing bluegills or hearing bluegills sucking and doing that kind of thing, Definitely want to fish that area and around the adjacent areas of where that activity is because, uh, you know, the, the bass are never far away from where the food is. You know, we can't have this discussion about pad fishing without talking about boat control. It's critical. Uh, you, you don't, what you, you know, you, you want to go, you want to move as slowly as you can when you're, when you're moving around the pads. I'll usually position my boat near the edge. I see a lot of guys positioning their boat way outside that edge of pads. That's hard to fish if the fish are back in there. You know, you, you, you don't tend to get that vertical fall unless you're closer to, the, to where you're pitching. So I like to get to the, unless the fish are right out on the edge, I like to get to close to the edge of the pads and pitch in about a rod length or two in into those pads and then just let that bait fall down and work it. Uh, usually that's the way I'll go about it and I'll fish very slowly. I don't want my boat to enter into those pads. In other words, I don't want the nose of the boat or any part of the boat to, to bump into those pads because if that happens, if there are fish in that area, they're going to sense that and they're going to become alarmed. Uh, they may not move out, but they'll become alarmed and they're less likely to eat. The, the, the one thing I have noticed over the years with these padfish, when they're as thick as what you've seen in this video, those fish feel protected. Like I've thrown, I've thrown frogs, for example, and that have landed and scared the bass. As soon as it landed, the bass would just like, you know, try and get out. But oftentimes they turn right around and eat that frog. They're not really scared. They just got startled. They feel comfortable under that protection. And so sometimes you can get right up on them, surprisingly so. And, you know, I've got, I've, I've had situations where I would be the nose of the boat right in the pads and I would drop the bait from the tip of my rod right down in front of me, right under the boat, right in front of the boat. And I've caught fish that way. They're secure down there. Uh, but you don't want to go pushing it either. You don't want to push your boat in the pads and move in all the stems and all the, all the leaves. They're not that secure. <laughs> you'll, you'll put them on alarm and, and when you do that. And you, the other thing is you want to try and use your trolling motor sparingly. Uh, you know, if you can use the wind to help you, that's, that's good so that you're not constantly on that trolling motor on and off. And, and even then I try and go on lower speeds when I am using, because you have to use it to, to navigate and to move around in those pads but you want to do it wisely. Um, 
and your electronics should be turned off. I found I turn mine off when I'm fishing that shallow. What's the point? I don't I don't need the electronics in that situation, or at least I don't feel I do. I can look at the pads and read the water. If there's a point of pads, I know what's under the water. So, or if there's a cut in the pads, I know what that's uh, what that's telling me. I don't need the, the electronics to tell me that. And because if you have that electronics on in that shallow water, you know you're pinging with those with that electronics, and uh, that pinging can be heard and picked up by the fish, sensed by them, and it could put them on alarm. So when I'm fishing shallow like that, I don't I don't have it turned on. I turn those things off. And lastly, I you know I never go pad fishing, uh, pitching a pads without having a frog and a toad uh, nearby because sometimes the fish they like to be they like to be blowing up in the in the last few weeks i've been fishing at naka mix and then not so much that would happen in the evening i'd get a few on a toad and a few on a frog that way or early morning uh but there's going to be days coming up usually this time of year now late august september uh where the fish start to to do a whole lot more surface feeding on the pads you'll hear them you'll see them blowing up and uh that's when a frog can be fished in those little openings or a toad on the edges uh, and they could be very uh, effective. And the thing about that is because the fish are coming up and hitting off the top, you can get your boat pretty far away, back away, and cast a long distance and never alarm those fish or be worried about alarming those fish. Uh, if you get a better opportunity to, to get some of those bigger ones to come up and, and uh, smash the toad or the frog. The harder thing is if you want to fish the thicker pads with the frog, is you have to actually get pretty good at working that frog to drop into the little openings because they're you know you see these pads on this video they're they're so thick they're over each other and there's no water in between them and so sometimes you just have to work your frog to get to a little opening you don't need much just get that frog to sit in that little opening so that the tails are sitting down and you know those bass will sense them when you're crawling over the pads those bass will sense that and they, they know something's up there if they're around or under it and they'll swim right to where that little opening is. Your your frog gets there, and the next thing you know, boom! It'll it'll you know the, sometimes they'll eat that way. I've caught some really big fish doing that. It's just once you set the hook, you got to get them in. And 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 that's the last thing I guess I'll talk about here. That is when you do get that bite, you know anything that feels different. Because oftentimes these fish they'll have what I what we call a pressure bite. They just grab it. They don't smash it hard. They don't grab it and swim away. They just kind of grab it and they just kind of stay there. And then when you go to lift up, you know, you're like, is that a pad or is that a, you know, it ain't that at all. Set the hook because more often than not, it's a fish if it feels a little heavier than normal. Now, there are times where these fish will hit very aggressively and sometimes they throw you off. Like I've had this happen, especially later in the day as the evening's progressing or on cloudy, dark days. You pitch that thing in there and it didn't even hardly enter the water and one's grabbed it and he's, you know, he's jerking the rod out of your hand practically. That happens too. Uh, but more often than not, it's a little bit more of that, especially when you have a bright sunny days, a little bit more of that pressure bite and you have to become aware when you have a bite. And, and the next thing then is when you, when you do that, when you think you have a bite, you have to commit to setting the hook. You have to just pop that thing back there hard and start reeling. You've got to get that fish up through those pads, up on top and across them. Otherwise they're going to get down in there on you and you're going to lose them. And it's just, it happened, you've seen it, it happened to me in this video a couple of times. Uh, more often than I'd like to, to admit, it does happen, but uh, there's opportunity there too. And so, uh, you know, I'm willing to give up a few fish to catch some too. One other thing I want to mention, what we didn't talk about yet, is is a little bit more on the equipment. You know, I mentioned bait caster, and so I, I, I like a medium heavy or a heavy rod in this particular case that has a tip so that I can flip and pitch. Uh, but more importantly, I'm using straight braid. I'm using braided line on my reel. It's straight braid. When, uh, when my bait is on there on the hook, you know, I color the line about seven or eight feet up and, and I just use a black marker and color the line and make it dark. I think it makes it harder for those fish to see when you're in that shaded pad area. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter. They don't seem to ever see it or notice it when you're in that kind of thick cover. Uh, and that braid just gives you so much more connection to your bait to feel what's going on down there. It's very important. Now here's something that might surprise you, the, the pound test braid that I'm using. You know, I use 20 pound test braid and, and you know, I can hear a bunch of people saying now, 20 pound test, you're fishing those thick pads, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> or, you know, what's, what's wrong? You, you gotta be fishing 50 pound braid or 65 or even 80. And, and uh, I don't disagree with that when you're throwing top water, right? When you're throwing toads and frogs and that kind of thing, fine, you want that heavy line because you're throwing it much further out you're dragging a fish over a larger area and you and you're on top you can afford to do it but when it comes to doing these uh, 
pitching in uh, these these baits and, and uh, pitching them in the pads, and they're going down to the bottom. Uh, somebody that I respect quite a bit once stated in one of their books, his name's Rich Zaleski. He's a very good fisherman up in the Connecticut ear area. And I'll never forget this. He, 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 wrote, he wrote that uh, when he's fishing those kind of circumstances, he likes 20-pound test braid. And, and, you know, and he said, why? You know, a lot of other guys like 50. And what he's found is that because the 20-pound test braid has that smaller diameter, when you go to set the hook, it cuts through the weeds better. And this is true for milfoil. It's true for pads. Any, any type of weed that you have, that smaller diameter braid just cuts right through it much easier than if it was thicker diameter, like, like 50 pound or even thicker still. And, and I started experimenting with that because he also stated he never had a fish break him off with 20 pound braid as long as he took care of the line. In other words, as long as after the day fishing, he cut it down, maybe you cut a couple feet off the line, you start over again because the, the end of the line, the, the part of the line that goes to the hook, you know, that up to a couple of feet, that's the part of the line that's getting a lot of the abrasion, you know, and when you're fishing pads like this. So he said he never had that situation. I started experimenting with 20 pound test and I found that I never had anything break off either. It's it's very strong line at 20 pounds. 20 pound braid is strong line and and yet that smaller diameter helps me rip it through helps me get it ripped through the pads and helps me get better hook sets and get those fish up and out of there so i'm sure i i am an oddball when it comes to that you know but i learned that from a very good fisherman he did it for a reason and so do i so i thought i'd pass that on to you well i hope you enjoyed this video you know this is this was a in-depth video one of the most in-depth videos i've done in a while uh, and so I hope you've watched it all and I hope you've learned it all because if you take these these things that I that I talked about today these concepts and, and you want to catch some fish this is one way that you can do it and the thing about it is not a lot of people are doing it I see people fishing the edge of the pads right there they, they get out there and I see this a lot uh, in three mile run they get out of that launch and there's some pads there and they go along the edge but they're never throwing deep into the pads they're throwing on the edge you know or they're they're throwing a frog near the edge or you know, but they're not they're not going into that you know you got to get into that thick stuff especially when the conditions are bright if you want to get to where the fish are and i think i've shown you how to do that in this, in this video so if you haven't tried it and, and you want to get out there and they're always good fish you know i don't catch little ones doing this they're usually pretty good average size so get out there and give it a shot and let me know how you do if you like the video Hit that like button. That helps me get it out to more and more people. Send this thing out to your friends if you thought it was worthwhile. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. When you do, hit that bell. That'll give you a notification for when the next video is ready. Remember, we're certified bassified. Uh, this channel is all about the art and science of fishing, especially bass fishing. We're going to be doing another video coming up about the Z-Crawl. We'll do a bait review on the Z-Crawl. And then sometime after that one, we're going to do another video about pad fishing with a whole different technique that is very effective and it's going to blow your mind. So you want to stay tuned and, and uh, check that out when it comes out. Hope to see you on the water and may God bless your fishing endeavors.